Amen. And good evening, folks, and welcome. It's Thursday, uh, time for Bible study. Uh, let's have a word of prayer uh, before we dive in. Father God, we're grateful tonight uh, for this opportunity, Lord God, just to rest in you uh, and to the rest in the knowledge of your word. We just thank you that as we feed on that sincere milk of the word, we're confident completely and totally that we will grow uh, in the knowledge of who you are and the knowledge of who you are in us and our purpose and function, Lord God, in making your kingdom visible to all around us and demonstrating the great love that you've shown to us, uh, to those who cross our path. And we just give you great praise and great thanks for this time tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are uh, going to be in Acts chapter 16. Uh, lots of different events occurring here. We're kind of past that pivot point um, that, we, uh, that we saw last time in terms of the gospel reaching out and real clarity uh, at this point in terms of, of what the gospel really should mean. Uh, we're going to see a couple of things, though. We're going to see that back and forth reaction uh, when Paul and Silas, and this time Timothy, uh, preached the gospel. Uh, so it's going to be really fascinating to see that all of that play out. Uh, in terms of, of questions to think about, uh, in, uh, uh, in the midst of this, we're going to uh, meet Lydia. Uh, and so one question to think about is uh, her conversion in Acts chapter 16, it says, highlights the power of God to work through unexpected circumstances uh, and individuals. And so um, just curious, uh, you know, if anyone at that point uh, would just like to talk about their own experience, you know, how things just fall together in a way that you hadn't thought about until all of a sudden you realize that it's one of those God moments. Uh, and so we'll just take some time to reflect on that as well as, again, any other questions that you might have or, or might want to discuss. Amen. So with that, let's go ahead and ha have a listen to Acts chapter 16. Chapter 16. Then came he to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, son of a certain woman, which was a Jewish and believed, but his father was a Greek which was well reported out by the brethren that were at Lystra and Lycaonium. Him would Paul have to go forth with him, and took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters, for they knew all that his father was a Greek. And as they went through the cities, they delivered them the decrees for to keep that were ordained of the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem. And so were the churches established in the faith, and increased in number daily. Now when they had gone throughout Phrygia, and the region of Galatia, and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. After they were come to Asia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. And they, passing by Mysia, came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia, and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel unto them. Therefore, loosing from Troas, we came with a straight course to Samothracia, and the next day to Neapolis, and from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia, and a colony. And we were in that city abiding certain days. And on the Sabbath, we went out of the city by a riverside, where prayer was wont to be made, and we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted thither. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple, of the city of Tharatara, which worshipped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized and consoled, she besought us, saying, If ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. Mm -hmm. And she constrained this. And it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel, possessed with a spirit of divination, met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us, and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out at the same hour. And when her masters saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas, and drew them into the marketplace under the rulers, and brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city, and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rendered their clothes, and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison, and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight 
Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep, and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword, and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light, and sprang in, and came trembling, and fell down before Paul and Silas, and brought them out, and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and all his, straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them, and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. And when it was day, the magistrates sent the sergeants, saying, Let those men go. And the keeper of the prison told this saying to Paul, The magistrates have sent to let you go. Now therefore depart, and go in peace. But Paul said unto them, They have beaten us openly, uncondemned, being Romans, and have cast us into prison. And now do they thrust us out privily? Nay, verily, but let them come themselves and fetch us out. And the sergeants told these words unto the magistrates, and they feared when they heard that they were Romans. And they came and besought them, and brought them out, and desired them to depart out of the city. And they went out of the prison, and entered into the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, they comforted them and departed. Amen. So exciting stuff there. Let me get to the, the beginning here. Sorry about that. Let me just go back, if you don't mind, to uh, to the beginning. Uh, we're going to just introduce uh, this idea of Paul meeting Timothy. This obviously is not a, a picture of Timothy. Uh, it's intended to be a representation. I like this one because it highlights the fact that um, most biblical scholars and researchers suggest that when Paul met Timothy, Timothy could have been as young as 14, most say probably 17, and probably not older than 21. Um, which is really kind of remarkable. And, and you'll see as we talk a little bit about Timothy, how this factors in. I think it, I think it gives us some encouragement in terms of appreciating that, you know, the Holy Spirit operates in people the way the Holy Spirit chooses. And I know in, uh, you know, in our culture today, while in some cases we celebrate youth, we also recognize um, that it culturally we don't necessarily appreciate fully the gifts of younger people because there, there is a, a factor just in our natural lives that knowledge and information is great, but it takes experience and living and years uh, for that knowledge to turn into more useful wisdom and insight. Uh, always exceptions to the rule. Uh, you see throughout the New Testament, there is certainly a focus on elders and eldership both in terms of elders referring to age, as well as the wisdom required to uh, administer uh, a congregation. Uh, and in this instance, we find a really exceptional case uh, where a really, really young uh, person uh, is, uh, is given that responsibility. And uh, according to what we hear about Ephesus in particular, uh, does a really good job of it. And so I think it's just kind of fascinating uh, that Paul meets Timothy, and there's something about him. A lot of it, uh, as we'll see in a second, has to do with a pedigree that has been passed down to Timothy. Um, and so here he is in in uh, in verse three, uh, and this is Timothy is the him. Him would Paul have to go forth with him? So he meets Timothy and says, "You need to come and travel with us." And took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. And we'll come back to this issue of circumcision and Timothy in particular a little bit later and uh, provide a little bit more insight in terms of understanding circumcision. But it's kind of fascinating here, right, that Paul determines to do something that we know he doesn't believe in spiritually. So kind of tuck that away. Again, we'll come back to this and I'll show you just a couple of short videos to give you kind of a natural insight into circumcision and a little bit of a spiritual insight as well. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about, about Timothy in this particular instance. So we know, uh, again, because it, it starts out saying that Timothy was born and raised in Lystra, which is, is in Asia Minor. And again, this is part of 
uh, what's been referred to as Paul's second missionary trip. And so we'll, we'll look a little bit uh, from place to place and follow through on what we see happening here in Acts chapter 16. Um, Lystra there is inside the red circle. Down at the bottom, the, the red dot, that's basically Jerusalem, Nazareth, where they started out. And if you recall, uh, when we're dealing with Acts 13 and 14, we trace that first missionary trip from place to place. Uh, in this instance, uh, they go right to uh, Lystra, and this is where we pick it up in Acts chapter 16, where Paul meets Timothy there. We're going to continue around that journey uh, in terms of some of the other cities there. We're going to hit um, Thessalonica. Uh, we're going to pass through a, a number of places. We're going to stop in Philippi, of course, as you heard. We're also going to hit Berea. And so a number of these cities that Paul is visiting, some of them are new because he gets, uh, as we'll see, some new direction from the Holy Spirit in terms of where he needs to take the ministry. Uh, Timothy has a mom and dad and a grandmother, although Paul really only pays attention um, to his mother and his grandmother. Uh, and he, he basically refers to this when he writes the letter to Timothy. And this is the second time he communicates to Timothy, and he's encouraging him because, again, he's in a very difficult situation being really, really young and also um, having a congregation that he is the elder over in, in Ephesus that has its own particular problems. And so Paul says in, in uh, 2 Timothy 1.5, when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. It's Eunice in the Greek. We pronounce it Eunice, you know, in our, in our everyday language. And I'm also persuaded is in you. You know, and so we talk about um, providing our children and grandchildren a spiritual legacy. I know a lot of us, uh, you know, credit our grandmothers and grandfathers with our salvation today. I know for a fact, uh, particularly my grandfather in a very, very direct way, my grandmother in a much less direct way. And these are my, my, my mother's parents. I didn't know my grandfather on my father's side. He passed away before I was born and only got to know my grandmother on my father's side a bit. And they were all spiritual folks that, they were inclined, but my mother's mother and my mother's father were really uh, serious on it. And so I know for a fact, amen, like a number of you, that that legacy of spiritual climate was passed down. Regardless of what they believed, right, in terms of the specifics, they knew Jesus, amen, and that's all that counted. And so Paul bears witness to the fact that he sees in Timothy that spiritual legacy uh, that was been passed on by his mom, and then going all the way back to his grandmother. Uh, again, his his dad is credited, uh, you know, as as being there. But again, um, one is a Jew, the other is a Greek. Uh, com some complexities, which we'll we'll address later, particularly when we talk about the circumcision thing. Um, his dad being Greek um, presents less issues for him than his mom being a Jew, simply because of the conflict that we've already seen. Uh, in terms of how the Jewish Christians, as well as the Jews who haven't accepted Jesus as Messiah, how they react to the teachings of Paul. And so they have to navigate those difficulties as well. Um, so Timothy, uh, and this was kind of surprising to me because, you know, I've read, I've read this, you know, how many times have we read Acts just in passing? And I never really focused on uh, the fact that Paul um, had Timothy travel with him and Silas and Barnabas. I just you know, just kind of picturing a meeting Timothy, and then later on in the New Testament, he writes letters to him. But he's pictured in ha having traveled to Corinth, to Greece, to Rome, Ephesus, and Macedonia. Macedonia is referred to as Asia Minor. You will you, you will see that on uh, another quick map that I'll show you. Uh, and other cases, uh, Paul leaves Timothy in another place while he goes to minister and then calls to join him. Uh, and so I, it was surprising to me again, even having read this, how much travel Paul did with Timothy. And seeing that now, it makes all the sense in the world that Paul would have a lot of confidence, again, both knowing his spiritual legacy and probably, you know, Pastor Reed and I have gone on a, on a, a few mission missionary trips and the experienced missionary folks always sort of train you, see what you can handle, throw you out there in front of a crowd of folks. Um, and, and I, I get the picture, and it may or may not be biblically accurate, but I get the picture that as Paul and Barnabas and Silas are traveling and Timothy's there, 
they might say, Timothy, you know, we're going to be preaching to these folks tonight. Why don't you take care of the, of the prayer session? Or why don't you open us up in prayer? You get the feeling, you know, knowing that he traveled that much, that Paul did a lot, again, to help equip Timothy for the ministry that he obviously observed, you know, uh, that Timothy was to be given. And so he's mentioned uh, as traveling quite a bit. Um, again, ultimately, Tim Timothy ends up being an elder in the congregation at Ephesus. I know that the common um, story is that he was a pastor in Ephesus. And that's only because we just don't have a clear New Testament picture of how things were organized. If you look throughout the New Testament, pastor is mentioned twice. And there's no real reference to pastors, mainly because, again, what Paul did and all the, the disciples did, because it was the pattern of the synagogues, is that when they established a congregation, they appointed a group of elders and deacons to oversee the church. Among that group of elders were various gift ministries as well. So some of the elders were apostles, some were prophets, some were pastors. All of them were teachers. Uh, and that's where we get the, the plurality of ministry. And so Timothy uh, was probably, I guess, if we had to make a corollary to it, he was the presiding elder and may have taught, of course, and things of that nature. Uh, but the whole concept of an individual or a couple pastoring a church is not a New Testament concept. Uh, amongst that plurality, again, were people with different gifts and callings, and they were utilized whenever uh, the, the occasion called for it. Um, the, one of the, the things that also occurs uh, is just the importance, again, of Paul, again, encouraging Timothy, right, to have good character and not to let um, people look down on him because of his age. And so, again, he's in charge of a lot of other people as well as ministering to uh, to this particular congregation. I, I won't get sidetracked on this because it, it certainly is a small point, but in um, in Timothy and in Titus, right, we see qualifications for different uh, functions in the church, particularly in terms of elders. And uh, a lot of those lists are actually used uh, to, to go down the list to make sure that people qualify. The reality is that the list in Timothy is not identical to the list in Titus. And that's because, like you would expect, the situation in Ephesus was different than the situation where Titus ministered in Crete. And so eldership, uh, as Paul was helping them figure it out, was going to be critical to minister in very different ways. The common denominator between both and the only real qualification for eldership is, one, to have a good reputation inside the congregation and to have a good, a good reputation in the community. Uh, and that's why Paul talks about good character. And so uh, we've gone astray in, in a lot of instances, amen, in terms of translating what the New Testament actually says about church government and church leadership into our culture, which has a very hierarchical pyramid approach because that's the way our society is organized. It's the way businesses are organized. Uh, but again, it just isn't the way it ought to be. And we need to rethink this, I think, because Jesus said, Himself, he says, you know, leadership among the heathens, the Gentiles, is very clear. One person is in charge and tells everybody else what to do. And he says, we don't do that in the kingdom. We don't do it the way the Gentiles do it. The way we do it is the person who is in charge is the greatest servant. And that applies to Christian businesses, congregations, and households. And so we, we, we learn an awful lot uh, in terms of how these things really should be addressed if we're trying to follow a clear biblical line of thinking. And it's hard. You know, I think, um, you know, even with my insistence on doing it this way or that way, I think we have to recognize that the most important thing is to preserve the quality of our experience as believers. And so if we do need to make a transition, it needs to be something gentle and delicate enough so it doesn't just disorient people. It, it's it's hard not to get disoriented just reading the scripture every day. Amen. Uh, so I'm, 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 you know, as you can tell, really passionate about this particular issue. But at the same time, we don't want to destabilize people, you know, all of a sudden. And so it's something that, you know, uh, I know at Global Truth, uh, Pastor Reed and I have been working on for years to try to bring us closer and closer and closer 
uh, to a little bit more of a New Testament model. Not that it's a matter of right or wrong. It's just when the foundation is set, we can really depend on the spirit to flow. So again, uh, some fascinating stuff that we learned uh, just in terms of Timothy. Uh, so we, we get now to this issue here. Uh, the, the same verse here, verse three, uh, Timothy, right? Would Paul have to go forth with him and took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in the quarters uh, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. It says it was well reported that his father was a Greek. And so again, this is, this is a fascinating insight in terms of Paul's mentality. I have always found Paul a little hard to deal with and understand because on some cases, he's incredibly rigid in his application of spiritual things. And in other places, unbelievably flexible. And, and it's not a criticism of Paul. It's a criticism of my understanding and, uh, you know, my own way of thinking about things. But we know for a fact that Paul does not believe that circumcision is a sign of the covenant. He does not believe that it's valid. But what he does is he, wherever he's at, he accommodates the needs of people in order to, to provide an, uh, an open door for the gospel. And so, you know, he'll say, you know, to the Jew, I'm a Jew, to the Greek, then I'm a Greek, I'm all things to people. Now, you could read that on one hand, that he's sort of wishy-washy, but again, his purpose is not to let these minor things get in the way of the receptivity of the gospel. And this is just such an important point for us today. Uh, another example of this, of course, is in Corinth, where the custom was for um, men and women to fool with headdresses. Uh, for the Jews, the, the headdress was a sign of unworthiness before God, the yarmulke, the kippah, whichever one you want to call it. And, Paul's, and, and the women would basically braid their hair on their heads to signify the same thing. And Paul did not believe that we were at all unworthy, but he basically said, when you're around them, just, just follow their custom. Just, just do what they do. As long as it doesn't interfere with your observance of your relationship with the Lord, but don't let these cultural things get in the way of the opportunity to share the gospel. So it's kind of complex, you know, uh, but basically uh, he understands that if the other Jews who they'll be ministering to know that Timothy is both a Greek and a Jew and he's not circumcised, it's going to create a huge barrier uh, for Timothy. Now, if I'm Timothy at 17 years old, I'm like, dude, do we really, <laughs> do we really need to go through this? Isn't there a simpler way to handle this? But uh, Paul wants to make sure that uh, that Timothy doesn't run into any, any conflicts or difficulties. Uh, so he basically circumcises, you know, the, the nearly adult Timothy uh, because he doesn't want to, to strike up any more barriers to the gospel than the Jews and the Jewish Christians are already presenting. So kind of fascinating stuff. I thought you might be a little bit interested just in, in, uh, in pursuing this. I don't know, of course, how many of you have studied uh, the, the concept of circumcision. There are some... Uh, scientific medical reasons. We'll talk about those real quick in a short video. And then there's some deeper spiritual elements. So here is circumcision part one, uh, a little bit of the science. It's not the best video in the world, but it's the only one I could find that was short and sweet and really I, I thought had some credible information. So we'll take a look at this one about the science of it. And then we'll take a second look at a very short video as well that talks about some of the deeper spiritual sides of the practice of circumcision. Okay, that doesn't want to work. The Bible tells us in Genesis 17, 12, and he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generations, written 1491 B.C., Leviticus 12, 3, and in the eighth day the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised, written 1490 B.C., this tells us circumcision was to be performed on a male child on the eighth day after birth. Science now tells us prothrombin reaches its highest levels in a newborn infant on the eighth day after birth, discovered by Dr. S. I. McMillan, AD 2000. Immediately after birth, even a small cut could endanger an infant's life. However, on the eighth day after birth, and only on the eighth day, a natural clotting agent called prothrombin increases to its highest levels. 
This makes it the safest day under normal conditions to perform circumcision without excessive bleeding. The production of prothrombin occurs from vitamin K being naturally produced by bacteria in the intestinal tract of a newborn. Today, many newborns in hospitals are given a vitamin K shot so they can clot effectively without waiting the full eight days. From 1491 BC to AD 2000, there is a time span of 3,491 years. How did Moses, the author of Genesis and Leviticus, know that the eighth day after birth was the safest day for a male child to be circumcised? If you like this video, please hit the like button below, share it with your friends, and please be sure to subscribe. God bless you and have a great day. Amen. Outside of the uh, of the science of it, the fact that there are some scientifically sound reasons, the idea that 3,500 years ago, the Lord passed along knowledge and information that we didn't discover until the year 2000. I just find those things fascinating. Don't need them to strengthen my faith, but it's just amazing the insights that we have. And so that's the natural reason for circumcision and the reason for doing this on, on the eighth day biblically. Here's a second video. Uh, this is, uh, I, I've listened to these guys uh, from time to time. I'm not a huge fan um, in, in terms of some of the connections they make between old and new. They can be a little bit rigid in terms of of, uh, of uh, Torah doctrine. Uh, but these are believers uh, and they're gonna provide, I think a pretty enlightening um, view in terms of the spiritual dimension of circumcision with an equal sense, again, God's unbelievable insight and how that gets passed along to us. And so these are the Messiah guys who are gonna share a little bit with you in terms of that. And so, uh, but then since he tried to do it through Hagar and since, you know, Sarah laughs and all these things, the, the sign of the covenant, the sign of the Messiah coming is that, you, and what a barbaric action, right? To take away the flesh of, of the procre of the organ of procreation from the male. Why? Well, and this is where the, the virgin birth ties in so well. And this is why we see the virgin birth. It's prophesied through the act of circumcision, taking away the flesh of the male organ of repro uh, reproduction is saying that the, that the human element of man, of the man will be taken out. It's taken off the table. Taken off the table. Exactly. It's the same way of Abraham, like, look, only this this lapid is going through the only this pillar of, of of flame is going through the covenant pieces. Right. This is not it, Abraham has no uh, ability to alter the terms of the covenant. Of, of, exactly. Right. Right. And exactly. the circumcision is just is a seal of this faith of this but it's a sign of the messiah thing. that's the greatest part is that is that the cutting away of the foreskin is is a sign of the messiah coming it is a, the sign that the messiah will come through a virgin birth that he won't have the sin nature right that the sin nature won't be there that mankind can't do it themselves they need god to help it's a it's a wonderful picture don't miss any clips hey man i i think it's a wonderful picture as well and until i saw that uh, particular video i never made that kind of connection. And so it, it does um, put circumcision in a whole different perspective because it is actually predicting, forecasting, foretelling of uh, Jesus. And again, this incredible point they make about uh, the human element being taken away. So I hope that's uh, beneficial to you, at least in terms of appreciating, um, you know, the, the importance and the value of circumcision and why as a sign of a covenant, it's something that uh, we can now appreciate. And so from here, um, after, um, after Timothy is, is, uh, they ba basically made Timothy aware of, uh, the connection. They, they start to travel through all the different cities and what they're doing essentially is remember in Acts 15, when they had the big discussion about what do we tell the Gentiles they need to do? They basically write a letter, uh, explaining to them, you know, stay away from things offered to idols, things that are strangled thing with blood and definitely stay away from fornication. So Paul, Silas, Timothy, as they go from city to city, their primary role and the primary reason for their trip was to basically deliver this letter. And again, uh, the letter was really well received because one, it reduced the burden uh, that was being placed on the new believers 
um, you know, you preach freedom in Christ as long as you do all of these things, right? And that's where a lot of our confusion is today. You know, what really is required uh, to receive Jesus, Lord and Savior, and to do the work of the ministry, and it is not very much. Contrasted to after we do receive Jesus, there's a lot to do. There's a lot of work to do, but the work is the result of our salvation, right? And not needed to gain that salvation. And that's a, that's a really um, confusing point that we see a lot in the church. Some people say we don't need to do anything. Some folks say we need to do everything, and they're both right. <laughs> Amen. Nothing to do to receive it, but there's a lot that gets done uh, once we have. And so their initial, again, goal for this trip uh, is simply to carry out the message uh, that the apostles and deacons and everybody who uh, gathered in Jerusalem uh, decided to, uh, to, to share. What happens, though, changes the course in their direction. And so, again, they go through several different cities to Phrygia um, and, and other places, as you heard in the, uh, in, in the, in the reading of Acts chapter 16. And then as, they're, as they are uh, um, residing, I think they get to Troas, all right? And so Paul has a vision. It, it's, it's not specific in terms of the nature of it, but it wasn't a dream, right? Paul either hears something and sees something and it isn't really clear. We, maybe we can go, we, we could go back and take a closer look. But I get the impression that Paul wasn't the only one who participated in the vision. And what they see is uh, that a man uh, calls to them and says, you need to come to Macedonia. You need to, to take a left and, and go west or go east into Asia Minor and come to us and preach the gospel. Um, prior to this, when we heard Acts 16, it mentioned that the Holy Spirit had forbidden them to go to certain places. They just felt, nah, we shouldn't do that. We shouldn't do that. And now comes again, the Macedonian call as it's been uh, referred to, where they see in a vision, uh, someone beckoning them to come to Macedonia and to preach the gospel. This had to be again, a pretty powerful vision, uh, powerful enough that they actually uh, changed course. Uh, verse 10, and after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. And so they, they take a turn and they start to go northeast uh, up towards Philippi. Um, I, I can't remember how it's pronounced, but it's not Philippi. It's Philippi or something like that. It's just the, you know, translating from the Greek words to the English. It's kind of interesting how certain words are pronounced. Uh, but they basically go from Troas to what we would call Philippi uh, in obedience again to the call they get from, from the Macedonians. Uh, one of the first things that happened uh, is another one of those is one of uh, those chance meetings that I mentioned uh, at the onset in terms of potential question. Uh, Lydia is uh, from Thyatira. Uh, if you know the word, if you know the city Thyatira, it's probably because you recall it from the book of the Revelation. Thyatira is one of those seven cities kind of in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an oval shape right on the edge of Asia Minor. Uh, and she is from uh, one of those cities, Thyatira. Lydia is a seller of purple. So Lydia is a textile merchant. She basically takes cloth and dyes it a color purple. That purple color comes from a very uh, from a very specific sea snail. I don't know how in the world these things get discovered. Who figured out, right, that this particular sea snail excretes a chemical that will turn cloth this incredible rich purple color? And so Lydia is a textile merchant. She's responsible for acquiring the cloth, overseeing the process, and selling the cloth. So she is a businesswoman for real serious businesswoman. And she is by the river and Paul and Silas and Timothy are just kind of hanging out in, in a prayer meeting. Imagine, you know, if, uh, if any of the three of us went to the park, right? And we would just, uh, you know, have a time of prayer. And more than likely as believers, we're going to start to just discuss some biblical stuff and we're having a conversation. And here's Lydia who is there on business by the river and she hears the conversation. Just this chance meeting uh, with, uh, you know, with this missionary group, and she overhears their conversation. And as it says in, uh, in Acts 16, something happens to her heart. She, she, she grasps this message in such a way uh, that she invites um, 
uh, Paul and Silas and, and Timothy to stay uh, to, to share the gospel with her and her and her entire household. Verse 14, and a certain woman named Lydia, seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of a Paul. So just as I'm sure a bunch of us can, uh, can recall, the circumstances by which we heard the gospel and believed just were the intersection of all of these unexpected events. And when she was baptized and her household, she besought us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. She convinced them, hey, come and stay here, uh, you know, if you think that this is a place that is, you know, spiritually healthy. So it, it really is, uh, as uh, Candace says in the chat, God is amazing. Amen. God is amazing. We could talk a lot more about Lydia um, any, any time in the New Testament that someone is the head of a household where uh, people meet and gather for spiritual things, that's the closest thing in the New Testament to a pastor. And so this explodes a lot of our, you know, theoretical theology around whether women can do this or women can do that. New Testament is pretty clear. And it's probably going to be the case that Lydia is one of those pastors. She's in charge of the believers who are a part of her household and anyone else who comes in to be a part of that. Uh, and so Paul staying there, again, kind of solidifies, you know, uh, her calling and the work that she does. And we're going to meet her at the end because after their experiences, they come back and they stay uh, with Lydia in her house until they move on uh, to their next uh, next journeys uh, that we'll pick up in Acts, uh, Acts 17. Um, as they go forth in Philippi, uh, they are met with a damsel. Uh, she basically works for some merchants, uh, and they make money on her ability to tell the future. Uh, and Paul um, is out, uh, Paul, Silas, and Timothy are out, and she follows them. What's amazing is their discernment that this is the spirit of divination, because she's basically saying, hey, look at these guys. They come to share with us the true path to God. Now, you would think that if you're out on a missionary trip uh, in a foreign country and you've had all these difficulties all along, that you just love the fact that you got some support. But their discernment is so keen that Paul recognizes this is not the real thing. She's saying the right thing, but it's not actually what's going on. This, this whole concept of divination is something to really appreciate, right? It begins in the garden, uh, the idea of twisting the knowledge of God to reveal a different future than the Lord's intent. Uh, the enemy in the garden basically is the spirit of divination, the nakash. It is the spirit that can take true, uh, true words and twist them. So, you know, we all know the story. Uh, they are told, hey, don't eat of the tree in the middle of the garden. Stay away from that one. And the enemy says, yeah, the only way he, they want, the only reason they don't want you to eat that is you'll be like them. And it twists their understanding. It's that spiritual demonic power that twists their understanding because the reality is they're already in the image and likeness of God. And so this, this begins in the garden and it is still present with us today. It has taken incredible forms and shapes. In the Old and Old Testament in particular, it's pretty straightforward. You can see, again, the definition of there, a practice that is mainly about telling the future, right, or discovering hidden knowledge, um, generally looking at omens, other kinds of supernatural powers. Appreciate that this isn't make-believe stuff. This is a real realm that really exists. And I think one of the dangers in our culture today, and I know this, this is something that impacts me, I, I've seen so many movies that talk about these hidden knowledge and, and all these kinds of things that you sort of just grow dull. You, you just, you know, ghosts and goblins and paranormal stuff, you're kind of like, yeah, I've seen that. You know, it's make-believe. And we lose that connection without recognizing that these are actual things that go on. Uh, they happen on a regular basis. You got to appreciate that if the Old Testament keeps telling you not to do something, it's because that thing is real. Uh, just the number of cases, Deuteronomy 18.10, there shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or his daughter as an offering 
anyone who practices divination or tells fortunes or interprets omens or sorcerer. There is no need to tell you to avoid something if it doesn't actually exist. And we see, again, a bunch of different examples of that all through the Old Testament. 2 Kings 17, 17. And they burned their sons and daughters as offerings and used divination and omens and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger. We are in the midst of Jeremiah. Uh, and, and morning prayer. Jeremiah 14, 14 speaks of the false prophets saying, they are prophesying to you a lying vision, worthless divination, and the deceit of their own minds. And so this is a really real thing. Probably the most, um, in, in my reading of the Old Testament, the, the most uh, startling example is uh, basically King Saul. Uh, king Saul is made the king of Israel because they want someone who is physically appealing as a king. They don't want the spiritual realities, a whole nother side trip we could take on that. And Saul doesn't know what he's doing. He's uncertain in terms of how to be a king. And there's some good reasons for that in terms of his upbringing. Uh, but uh, basically Saul tries to get advice by getting a sorcerer to bring Samuel up out of the grave because he needs some advice. And he does it and Samuel says, Dude, what is wrong with you? <laughs> I'm not supposed to be here doing this. You know you're not supposed to act this way. And because of that, the kingdom is going to be torn from you. And so, you know, just, just appreciate uh, the reality of this spirit of divination. Um, I have my own opinions about where it operates and, and where it's at. I won't share those because they're just personal opinions. I don't want to defame, you know, anyone uh, you know, who might be popular or things of that nature. But we just we just need to keep our eyes open, not in a judgmental fashion, but just as Paul did, we need to discern, is that the real thing? Or is that once again, the uh, spirit of divination coming after us? One of the nice things, however, is the reason that the spirit of divination comes after us is because we're dangerous. If you don't have a message, right, if you don't have a relationship with the Lord uh, where your life and the words that you're sharing are producing life, enemy's going to leave you alone. You're, you're actually, you're no threat. But if your experience with the Lord is so real that you can produce life in other people by the sharing of, of the good news, you're, you're a problem. And so, you know, if you have been had to deal with this, it's it's actually a good sign. Amen. <laughs> it means you're doing something good for the kingdom. Uh, but it, it, it doesn't negate the fact that we need to be really mindful of how these things impact us and to be on the lookout for them. Not overdoing it, not going around looking for demons everywhere we go, but have that same discernment uh, that Paul had in terms of that. Uh, the problem that Paul encounters, however, is that once he calls the demon out of the damsel, she is of no more use to merchandise of her of the people who uh, she works for. And so they basically say, this dude has showed up here preaching that Jesus stuff, and we're going to lose all of our business. And so they, they report Paul and Silas and Timothy, Paul and Silas in particular, to the magistrates and basically say, you need to do something. These dudes are coming here talking all this nonsense, and they don't mention it killing business. They make an argument that you're going to see uh, mentioned several times. They basically say they're talking about another king or another ruler other than the one that we honor in terms of Caesar. Philippi, you know, is a Roman colony. It, it is basically conquered by Rome and run by Rome, which is going to actually be an advantage to Paul later on as we get to the end of this chapter. Uh, but they basically tell the authorities this is an insult to Caesar. Because they're, they're basically talking about this Jesus guy as if he were the king. And we know there's only one king, one emperor. And so, of course, uh, they basically take their advice. Uh, Paul and Silas uh, get beat. They basically beat them, it says, with many stripes and throw them in the inner prison. So I don't know if you recall when we talked about in, um, in uh, I guess it was Acts 10 or 11, where Peter was in prison. And we talked about, again, the places in the prison. So they're thrown in the deepest part of the prison. Uh, and this is where, again, you got to love Paul. He says, hey, dude, we're in jail. Let's praise the Lord. <laughs> and they start singing Waymaker or, you know, uh, Light of the World, Step Down in the Darkness, whatever, whatever spiritual song they want to sing. And, of course, the reaction is that the earth quakes. What, a, what an incredible encouragement for you and I. 
uh, in terms of finding the opportunity to praise the Lord in the midst of circumstances. They've been jailed, they've been beaten, and they're locked in stocks. Their hands and their feet are, 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 are in chains. They can't move. They can just sit there, and they decide, let's praise the Lord. Amazing. And, of course, as the story goes, there's an earthquake. It shatters the jail, and everybody's bonds uh, fall off. We also talked about previously when Peter was in jail that the jailer uh, is responsible for the prisoners, and if the prisoners escape, they lose their life. That happened uh, to the jailer when Peter uh, you know, was let free in Jerusalem. And so the Philippian jailer, uh, he sees the jail is, uh, the, you know, everything is falling apart. Uh, he, he doesn't he see or hear anybody. And he gets a sword not to go after the prisoners, but he's like, it's better off for me to kill myself than to have them come get me. And just as he's about to do that, they say, hey, dude, don't worry about it. Not only are we still here, but we convinced all the other prisoners to stay put as well. And the jailer's like, you did what? It, it was enough to hear you guys singing. I couldn't figure that out to begin with. You're, you're in stocks. We just finished beating you and you're praising some God. And now you made sure that everybody stayed in the prison when you could have left. And then of course, there's probably some other dialogue and uh, uh, Paul and Silas use this as an opportunity clearly to explain why. And, and the Philippian jailer's reaction is the same reaction that the gospel gets for the next couple hundred years or more when people hear it. They're like, if that's the God you're serving, I want in. How can I be saved? And when Paul and Silas minister to him, he says, you need to come, come to my house, my family. And he, he, the Philippian jailer uh, basically takes him home just like Lydia did and his entire household uh, received Jesus and they are baptized. Just an incredible story in terms of, you know, a, a, a forsaken situation, uh, basically ending up serving God's purposes. And again, it's their sensitivity to spiritual things that uh, allows them to, to do that. So I don't, I, it doesn't seem like they expected an earthquake or the jail to be uh, torn open. Um, I, I'm sure by this time, they understand the power of prayer and the power of praise. I, I'm not questioning that. But again, I'm not sure. It doesn't seem as if uh, that's what they thought was going to happen. They were just reacting to the circumstance and making a choice in terms of rather than moan and groan and complain and get concerned about being in jail, let's praise the Lord. He got us here. He'll get us out. What an incredible word for all of us as we go through, again, difficult times and circumstances. So um, th this, is, this is where you got to love Paul. And uh, I really see this last part of this chapter kind of in, in everyday terms. So the, um, the, the jailer, after all this, basically goes to the magistrates and says, hey, look, um, everybody's cool. Nobody left jail. These guys were really helpful. We need to set them free. And the magistrate says, okay, fine. They've already, they've, they suffered their penalty. Uh, let them go. And so the jailer comes back and says, hey, Paul, Silas, you guys are free. And Paul says, oh, really? Seriously? Like you beat us and you put us in jail and you condemned us and we did anything wrong. And now you want to let us go on the down low? No way. No way. As publicly as you embarrassed us, you are publicly going to release us. I could just hear Paul saying, uh-uh, dude, that ain't happening. No way. No, you don't. And uh, essentially, uh, they discover that Paul is a Roman citizen. This is why Philippi being a colony of Rome is critical. He's a Roman citizen. And you cannot punish a Roman citizen without a trial. It just doesn't happen. That's part of the value of being a Roman citizen. And so they realize, oh, my gosh, we have messed up. So they basically go themselves and they, uh, uh, they I'm, I'm sure there's some apology in there. It's not actually specified. But essentially, once the magistrates found out that Paul is a Roman citizen, they go down to the jail and basically tell them, you guys are, are free to go. And so they do leave uh, they, uh, out of the prison. And they went out of the prison and entered into the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, they comforted them and departed. Amen. We'll pick them up uh, in chapter 17. But what an incredible experience in just 40 verses. A lot went on uh, here in chapter 16. So with that, 
uh, we can open it up for any questions, uh, uh, comments, or discussions. Let me put those initial uh, that initial question up there if anybody wants to tackle that. But I'll open it up in general uh, for any comments, any questions, anything else you want to share. Amen. Anyone? The, the, the question here basically suggests that if you that if you like, uh, you can uh, share any experiences that you have that are relevant to this idea of unexpected circumstances and things just coming together for God's purposes. That the, that's the intent of the question, uh, to just to clarify that. Any takers on that again or or anything else that we've talked about? Going once? Going twice? Hello? Anybody? Yeah, Pastor Rita, go ahead. Oh, it's Candace. Oh, yeah, go, go ahead, Candace, and then Pastor Rita after you. Yeah, go ahead, Candace. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, no I really enjoyed the way that the passage about Lydia was written in, in particular when she had her salvation experience because it clearly states the Lord opened her heart. Man. And that immediately hit me in the chest because if you consider that passage logically, I mean, it just kind of hits you in the heart that if God, if God opened her heart, then God is also the one who closes heart. Oops. Oops. <laughs> Amen. And in my own circumstance that I'm going through, I remember y'all a long, long, long time ago, I was sitting in the triumphant church listening to Pastor Leroy, and I will never forget something that came out of your mouth that day. You were talking about you were talking about Jonah and the whale. <laughs> and you were talking about free will and how people would like to believe that they have absolute free will, right? Right. And you cracked this joke. You said, yeah, just ask Jonah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I do remember that. And I, I remember that day so clearly because it just it it caused the sovereignty of God to really explode in my understanding. Amen. Amen. Do you understand what I'm saying? I understand completely and totally. To this day, uh, when Pastor Reed and I are dealing with a situation that we know is inevitable, our expression is, yeah. we're going to Nineveh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you're going to because know god god is so he is he is love yep yep chess he yep. can play checkers <laughs> he plays chess not checkers amen and amen. god has a way of getting what he wants He's got a way of getting what he wants out of people. So I love that in that particular passage, he makes it clear. I'm yep. the one who opened Lydia's heart. Yep. It was me. So if, if you have someone in your life and their heart is closed completely towards you or open towards you, it's ultimately God's heart that is in the mix. And it's his hand that's in the mix. And it really, really spoke volumes to me because our circumstances as believers, we can find comfort in the fact that our circumstances are ordained. Our steps are ordered. So there is no circumstance that we can find ourselves in and think, oh, this is just random. It's not. It's God's hand. Amen. And he has a way of getting his purpose out of us in what when we are going through um what the word of god calls trials and tribulation 
And so reading that was very comforting to me personally, because I find that, yes, I, I know and I experience that God loves me passionately, but I also find that he makes it very clear to me that he is the one in charge and yep. I can either get with it <laughs> or I can deal with exactly however he's going to deal with me. Exactly. Exactly. I always uh, relate to that with, uh, you know, the story of Job, right? Job goes through all of this, uh, his trials and tribulations, right? And he comes back and he says, Lord, explain to me what happened. And the Lord says in so many words, um, you weren't, you weren't here when I put the universe together. So one, I don't know you an answer to your question. And two, you wouldn't understand if I told you. And Job is like, all right, I get it. <laughs> He's going to have his way. And his way is a way of love. That's that's the critical thing, right? If God were a tyrant, then this would be something to fear. But he always knows what's best for us. And if we'll, you know, go with the flow, we find ourselves always in a place of, of greater benefit than we were before. So amen to that, Candace. Great, great insight on that. Thank you so much for that. Pastor Rita, you still have a, a comment or a question you want to throw in? No, I think you and Candace covered it very well. Kudos. All righty. All righty. Anyone else? 